we are starting the second part of the sessions. So we are with Jacob again. He is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets at the Department of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. And today he will be presenting on the efficiency of markets and the debates surrounding such a topic. So welcome, Jacob. Go ahead. All right. Appreciate that, Fernando. All right. So today's question is, are markets efficient? Um, I should give my answer just quickly before I just to kind of put my cards on the table before hopping into stuff. I think by and large, yes, markets are efficient, um, but I'm going to sort of go over some reasons or some times, um, occasions where they're not and sort of let you make the decision yourself. So here's a quick outline. Um, talk about some welfare theorems in economics, sort of highlight and discuss what Pareto efficiency is. Uh, most of the lecture is going to be thinking about market failures, right? Where do these welfare theorems sort of break down? And then we'll turn to kind of the work of Ronald Coase, externalities, which is related to market failures, and sort of try to get a sense of some larger questions of efficiency. My bad. All right. So sort of two famous uh, welfare theorems in economics. The first welfare theorem sort of says under perfect competition, and we'll sort of get into what that means later, utility maximizing behavior by individuals and or profit maximizing behavior by firms leads to Pareto efficient outcomes. So what's a Pareto efficient outcome? An allocation or an outcome is Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient if there's no way to rearrange production or reallocate goods so that someone is made worse off without making someone else Oh, sorry, my bad. So you're, or reallocate goods so that someone is made better off without making someone else worse off. So you can imagine there's some allocation of goods. If we change the allocation ever so slightly and someone is made worse off, well, then that, that would be not right off. So thus, when these sort of assumptions hold, the allocation resulting from a competitive equilibrium or a competitive market setting, um, and that of a benevolent social planner are the same. So we have one sort of process, a sort of competitive market. The other is a sort of benevolent social planner deciding where to sort of how to allocate goods. And when these assumptions hold, those things are the same. The second welfare theorem is a sort of flip of the first welfare theorem. Uh, any Pareto optimum can be supported as a competitive equilibrium for some initial set of endowments. So essentially, the competitive equal or any Pareto optimum is possible. So any sort of any equilibrium or any um, allocation is Pareto optimal. This is kind of a formalization of Adam Smith's invisible hand, um, sort of worked on by economists in the 20th century. So again, I sort of said some, there's some key assumptions here about sort of how the market operates and some assumptions about the individual is sort of acting in that market. Some key things that I kind of want to highlight, um, there are more, but I want to sort of highlight these because we're going to kind of break them as we go throughout the presentation. So each actor has perfect information. So you can think if you're a consumer, you know everything perfectly about the things that you're buying. Firms and consumers are price takers, meaning they take prices as given, they don't set prices. Uh, another way to think about it is there's no market power. So there's no monopolies. Also, there's no externalities in sort of this world. Um, so private cost always equals social cost. And so when these hold, we get these sort of first and second welfare theorems uh, to kind of reiterate. Under perfect competition, utility maximizing behavior by individuals and profit maximizing behavior by firms leads to a Pareto efficient outcome. So Again, to kind of answer the question, when these assumptions hold, the answer to the to our market's efficient, it's yes, um, very much so. Now, you might say there are some limitations to this Pareto efficiency idea. The first is it's a bit stringent, perhaps it's too stringent. Um, we can sort of back up a little bit and sort of reformulate and think about a less stringent condition. Uh, we can call an allocation or a reallocation a Caldor-Hicks improvement or Caldor-Hicks efficient 
if those that are made better off could hypothetically compensate those that are made worse off and lead to a Pareto improving outcome. So this is sort of a less stringent criteria uh, that we can sort of judge market outcomes by. Another main one, which we sort of touched on a little bit last time is that Pareto efficiency ignores potential distributional concerns. So if one person has everything and everybody else has nothing, if that's the product of sort of competitive equilibrium, well, that's Pareto optimal, um, no ifs, ands, or buts. But maybe we don't like that. Um, so if there's sort of an endless number of Pareto, optim Pareto optimalities, we have some sense that some are better than others um, along these distributional concerns. Another sort of aspect to this is, well, what about making one individual a little bit worse off if many get a lot better? That would sort of fly in the face of this Pareto efficiency idea. But we have some sort of moral sense or some cultural sense that maybe this is okay. Um, and so maybe the Pareto efficiency is limited in that, in that sense. Maybe useless, um, but at least limited. So the big question that kind of that we're going to focus on today is, well, how robust is the first welfare theorem? And when the first welfare theorem breaks down, we often call this a market failure. And so there are plenty of reasons that the market might deviate from this sort of strict idea of Pareto optimality and thus, by definition, be in inefficient. So the sort of four that I, I want to highlight today are this public goods. Um, Second is problems of adverse selection or the market for lemons. Three is just for the tragedy of the commons. And four, um, sort of the, the one I want to focus on the most, sort of at the end of the lecture, is externalities. All of these are sort of in the news in some capacity. You just kind of have to look for them. And it's kind of fun. If you're sort of reading the newspaper and you sort of come across a story, then Oftentimes, one of these things is going on. It's often this externalities question. So it's a bit of homework for the reader. All right. So a public good, right, as opposed to a private good. A public good is a good that is non-rival in consumption and non-excludable. So what does that mean? Non-rival in consumption is, well, if I consume it, then that doesn't really take away from your consumption. Or if you consume it, it doesn't take away from my consumption. Non-excludable would be if you if, if a, a seller wanted to prevent someone from having it, well, then they, they really can't. It's sort of non-excludable. It's sort of out in the open. It's for me to take uh, whenever I'd like. And so this leads to a, a whole host of problems that don't exist in the sort of private good setting, private good being rivalrous in consumption and excludable, I sort of think bananas. A public good, a sort of a classic example, is broadcast TV and radio. You just have to tap into it and boom, you have it. So it's hard to price. Lighthouses is a famous um, example in economics. I think the light sort of shines along the harbor and if you're on the harbor just by chance, well, then you benefit from that light, even though you didn't pay for it. Right? it you, you can't exclude people from benefiting from the light on the harbor. And if I benefit from the light on the harbor, then you do as well. So there's, it's it is non-rival and non-excludable. So how do we how do we price it? You know, what how do we allocate um, the amount of light, as it were? Another classic one is sort of national defense issue. And this sort of, again, bumps into this non-rivalry and non-excludable criteria. The core problem with these public goods is a free rider problem. Individuals have an incentive to free ride on others' contributions. Think the lighthouses again. If people are sort of putting money into sort of funding the lighthouse and it's on, right, and, I, and we benefit, I benefit, from being able to see where I'm directing my ship. Well, I kind of think the light will be on whether or not I pay for it or not. So I'm going to shirk and I'm going to free ride on the other's contributions. Defense is another great example of that. Well, 
if everyone's putting the mo money into the pot for defense, well, then maybe I'll, I won't put as much or maybe I won't put it in as all to kind of free ride on others' contributions. But if everyone free rides, well, then the public good will not be provided at all. So there's a question of how do we pay for these things that aren't like apples or bananas, things like that. So this is sort of a contentious, you know, well-researched, well-debated topic in, in economics for the past 100 years, 200 years. The two sort of core ways to provision these public goods are by government provision or, you know, there's some aspects of private sector provision overcoming these issues. So because these goods are non-rival in consumption and non-excludable, meet and thus are difficult to produce because they're difficult to sort of price and get people to pay for, that means they're chronically underproduced, right? If no one's paying for the lighthouse, well, then the lighthouse won't shine. So how do we get the lighthouse to shine? Um, well, we can have government do it, right? Government is funded by taxes or by or sort of government revenue uh, at the point of a gun, we force people to pay in to the pool and we use that money to provide these public goods. It just sort of addresses the free rider problem through coercion. We'll just force people to, you know, put up the money for the lighthouse or put up the money for national defense. And this is a sort of classic way of solving this um, problem. Another way to do it, um, I don't see this as necessarily going against each other, by the way. We, we can have some goods that are privately produced um, while others are sort of done through government provision. They don't necessarily butt heads, but if you want, they, they can in, on, on the margin. Another way is through bundling or bundling of two goods, bundling a private good with a public good. So to piggyback on the lighthouse example, sort of a port can bundle fees for the lighthouse with those of docking at a sort of particular wharf. So if, you, if you're gonna dock at the wharf, then you have to pay to dock at the wharf and we're gonna sort of put the cost of the lighthouse into the docking. So if the port can refuse docking, then it can exclude ship owners from both using the wharves and the lighthouse if they're not paid. So this is sort of solving this problem. And while we're talking about lighthouses, historically, this is how lighthouses were often funded. So there are a lot of private uh, lighthouses in England and France and the US throughout its, their history. And this is sort of the main way that they were funded is through this bundling idea. So what we traditionally think of as a public good can be provided by um, the market if these sort of particular things kind of work out in the time and place. But government provision is sort of the main way that society sort of funds or handles this free rider issue. Another aspect of public goods is that we tend to think about public goods, or the publicness, the sort of the idea of non-rivalrous and consumption and non-excludable as a characteristic of the good. Um, and that's true to some extent, but it's not 100% true. Uh, technological innovations can make some goods that were non-excludable, excludable. So one example is a sort of encrypted digital content that can be restricted for, to paying subscribers. Um, another good example that I like, but it's a bit dated now, is if public TV and public radio were just is a public good, but one way to exclude them is to force the sort of users to have a cable box or cable TV box. Uh, again, a, a bit of an outdated idea, but if you sort of think back to your childhood, you'll, you'll likely remember this sort of cable TV box. Without that cable TV, TV box, you, you can't access um, the, the cable, can't access your television. So this is one way to exclude. And the invention of this allowed exclusion. Another way that, that's maybe a bit more modern is a sort of subscription-based model 
and turn public goods into sort of these club goods. A club good is excludable, but non-rivalrous in consumption. So sort of moving along one margin to, to think about how to price particular goods. All right, so another problem, sort of another breaking of the assumptions of perfect competition. I'll spend a little bit more time on this than did the last one. This is the problem of asymmetric information. In some markets, um, perhaps a lot of markets, buyers and sellers have different information or different access to information. This asymmetric information can lead to a, a market where only low quality goods are sold. So this sort of unravel in that way. A great example that I wanna walk through is the used car market or Acheron's Market for Lemons, a kind of famous paper. I think in the QJE, that it is definitely worth reading because there's sort of a lot of wisdom here. So first, you have to know, well, what's a lemon? A lemon is a low quality car and a peach is a high quality car or a, a, a good quality car. So imagine you're gonna sort of go buy a used car. You go up to the seller. He knows more about the car than you do, right? You can walk around the car, Try to check it out. Does it have any dents or scratches on it? Even if you drive the car, right? You, you don't really fully know the quality of the car. The seller knows the quality of the car. Maybe he's been sort of using it um, sort of for years. He kind of knows, ah, oh, like when it rains, the clutch sticks a little bit. Um, or if it's a sort of sort of more corporate seller, he has people sort of mechanics that look into the car, quality control, quality check the car, sort of up and down. So the core idea is, well, sellers have better information about the quality of the car than buyers do. And this poses a problem. So buyers cannot distinguish between a good car, a peach, and a bad car, a lemon. Um, so what, what happens? What do you do? Um, Buyers will only be willing to pay, will only be willing to pay a price based on the average quality of cars on the market. Why is that? Well, you you know, there's some proportion of lemons in the market. There's some proportion of peaches. It's difficult to tell is this particular car a lemon or a peach. So you kind of play the probabilities, and you're willing to pay a price based on the average quality of the cars on the market. You kind of go, well, most cars are you know, maybe so-so, well, then I'll, I'm willing to pay for a so-so car, even if the particular car in actuality is quite a good car. So this runs into the sort of problem of adverse selection and sort of, sort of the market for used cars unraveling. And so unpack what I mean by that. At this average price, right, sellers of good cars on the margin will leave the market. Why is that? Well, if the at the at the sort of average price, which reflects the proportion of sort of number of ca cars in the market that are lemons, maybe it's a sort of lower price. Well, if I have a nice car, then I'm I want to sell my car for higher than that average price. And given that I can't do that, I can't sort of I can't find a buyer then I'll hold off, I won't sell. And so that means that sellers of good cars are gonna leave the market on the margin. So now a higher proportion of cars on the market are lemons, which does what? It drives the price down even further. I right? think the, the proportion of cars that are lemons is higher, the average quality of cars in the market is lower, that's gonna drive the price down even further. This dynamic leads to the sort of market unraveling right? Think, well, the mark, the price is further. Okay, so more sellers are going to leave the market. That drives the price down further. More sellers are going to leave the market. And then the whole market unravels where only lemons are on the market. And they'll likely go unsold. So in some sense, the whole market sort of collapses into the sort of just junk. So some potential solutions to this, like how do we, how do we get away from this problem? Um, 
First is sort of signaling. Sellers of good cars use warranties, certifications, um, things like Carfax, or it's like, hey, this you know this is approved by so and so. Uh, one good example of signaling is, well, I, I bought the car from that sort of reputable dealer. Right? He, he can signal with his brand. That's sort of related to screening as well. Buyers use inspections, tests to identify good cars. They have a sort of third party mechanic come out, take a look at it, and um, let me know if, if it's a lemon or not. That sort of helps solve the problem. Another solution is sort of government intervention regulations on what type of car or the quality of car that you can sell on the used market, right? how the used car, car market will work, right? lemon laws, things like that. Now, you're probably wondering why, why are we talking about used cars? <laughs> this sort of seems a very niche, right? A bit unimportant uh, example, but the market for lemons is a sort of analogy for all problems or all markets that face adverse selection issues. So the number one market uh, that I could think of is healthcare. So health insurance markets face like loads of asymmetric information. You, the individual, have better information about your health risks than your insurance company does. So insurers can't perfectly distinguish between high risk and low risk individuals um, they, can, they can get some sense, but they can't perfectly distinguish. Just like you can't perfectly distinguish between a lemon and a peach. So at, at a given premium, only high-risk individuals are willing to pay for insurance, right? And then the di dynamic outlined begins, just like it does for the used car market. Only people who are high-risk individuals are sort of willing to buy insurance. And so, so some ways to sort of get around that or some potential solutions for adverse selection. These are three things again, signaling, screening, and government intervention. And if you have insurance, you'll sort of see these uh, in your everyday life. Individuals can undergo medical examinations or provide detailed health histories to kind of signal to your insurance company, <laughs> I'm not a lemon, right? I'm a peach. Uh, it helps insurers sort of better assess individual risk profiles and sort of provide all this information, your family history, all these things to sort of get a sense of who, who you are and how high risk are you. Uh, screening, right? Insurers use complicated risk adjustment models, predictive analytics, data analysis to get a sense of the probability of if you're a high risk or low risk patient. A popular one um, is government intervention, regulations mandating community ratings, um, subsidies or risk pooling mechanisms to stabilize these insurance markets, individual mandate or automatic rollout to ensure broad participation and to avoid sort of adverse selection problem, avoid the sort of market for insurance being predominated by high risk individuals. We can sort of mandate that everyone needs to, to enroll. You'll see all three of these today, just like you do on the used car market. So a third sort of way to sort of break the model, as it were, or to, to sort of violate the um, first and second welfare theorem is the tragedy of the commons. This is sort of related to externalities and a bit to the market for lemons idea. So this was a concept introduced by Garrett Hardin in 1968. The core idea, like in one sentence, describes a situation where individuals acting independently and rationally, right, maximizing their utility, according to their own self-interest, behave contrary to the broader group's long-term best interests. Often, this results in the depletion or destruction of a shared resource. So one great example of that is sort of common grazing land. So shared grazing land sort of used by multiple herders, let's say you and 10 other herders, you have perhaps everyone has five or five cows or five sheep. And I send my sheep or cows out to pasture. Well, as a herder, I have an incentive to add more animals to increase their personal gain. 
right? It's a common field. I sort of add a sixth cow, seventh cow, an eighth cow. They're sort of benefiting from this the, the shared land. But the grazing land, the, sh the shared resources, becomes overgrazed and degraded. It's in my personal self-interest to add sort of another grazing cow, but it's not within the larger group's interest. So if we're all sort of adding additional cows or additional sheep to the grazing land, that's going to lead to sort of depletion of this common resource. Eventually, the grazing land will be stripped of all edible grass because it's in my self-interest to add another cow, but that leads to this sort of depletion. Some other examples, um, which you'll sort of hear a lot about in the news, are again, this is like another I pick up the newspaper and sort of look for these. Overfishing and open access fisheries. Um, one sort of great historical example is whale oil, right? So whale oil is a sort of valued commodity prior to the invention of kerosene, sort of traditional uh, oil products that we think of today. And whale oil obviously comes from whales. And so you have to fish for whales out in the open ocean. Well, if I can get an extra whale, I catch another whale or catch another two whales, then that benefits me, but that depletes on the margin the sort of total number of, number of whales in the ocean. Similar to this overfishing is the, uh, the issue of sort of hunting bison in I think the 18th and 19th century, right? It's in my benefit to sort of to kill another bison for meat or for warmth, but that depletes the, the population even further. And, you know, it's in my incentive to get one. What, what do I care how it benefits the sort of larger sort of community? Another example uh, sort of should be very familiar to you is sort of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, right? The earth is the climate as it were is a sort of common pool resource. I benefit from polluting it on the margin. Um, the population as a whole, well, however, it does not. Right? Others, deforestation and habitat destruction is sort of related to this air pollution idea, overuse of public parks and recreational areas. If you go to a, often if you sort of go to a public park, um, you often see this problem, right? Trash is thrown on the ground. Well, it, it doesn't really benefit me to walk all the way over to the trash can. I'll just throw the trash on the ground. Um, over time, if there's sort of that's not policed, or there's sort of those externalities aren't sort of internalized, well, then the public park is going to be full of trash, right? Because it, it doesn't doesn't benefit me to clean it up. So why is this? What, what what's the cause? The root cause of the sort of tragedy of the commons? First is the sort of lack of well-defined property rights. One example of, of, of sort of, well, or I'll hold off. Um, another cause is sort of the incentive to maximize personal gain at the expense of the common resource, uh, right? Getting another whale or killing another bison at the expense of the, the common resource. Right? It's difficult to exclude users from this resource, right? There's, it's difficult to sort of say, oh, you can't hike, hunt these bison or you can't um, fish here. And that sort of adds to the problem. Also, the sort of absence of effective regulation or management in a sort of pure tragedy commons problem. There's a potential solution, um, privatization, establishing private property rights. So it's a sort of old story when imagine there's sort of some endangered species that's almost hunted to extinction because of the sort of common problem, the sort of common resource problem. If we privatize, we sort of allow people to own or sort of grow and take care of these species, then they have an incentive to ensure their survival into the sort of the next generation. And so this privatization actually leads to sort of this rejuvenation of the common pool resource. Another example, um, if you sort of live in DC, New York, uh, Philadelphia, 
you'll see these scooters around, the sort of lime scooters. You, could, you should ask, why aren't those things like destroyed all the time, right? You, I could just like throw them on the ground or just destroy them. Um, but the companies, like I think Lime is, is, is an example, well, they own that scooter. And if you break it, then you're sort of liable. So they have established private property rights over that scooter, even though it sort of appears to be a common, common resource, anyone can use it. So they sort of solve that problem by establishing a property right and enforcing uh, overusing the scooters, as it were. Another classic example or solution is government regulation, right? restricting access or the use of the resource. Um, permits is it would be an example. It's also an example of market-based solutions or sort of saying only so many people can fish on the ocean or only so many people can sort of fish in this area or hunt in this area. Community-based management, local governance, collective action um, is another sort of potential solution. And related is a sort of market-based solution, particularly sort of tap or a cap and trade, right? We're, we'll cap the number of, sort of like the number of, or the quantity of pollution and you can sort of trade your permits around and that should result in a sort of efficient allocation of pollutants. But it does sort of, the goal is to sort of limit the number of pollutants. This is Eleanor Ostrom, who sort of worked on these issues. Uh, she was alive from 1933 to 2012. Here's her receiving the Nobel Prize in 2009 for sort of trying to tackle some of these issues. Uh, it's worth noting she was the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize, uh, by the way. So her, most of her work challenges the idea, challenges the conventional view that common pool resources must be either privatized or regulated by the government. She doesn't say that this sort of common pool resource is, is not a problem, but that there are successful examples of this community-based management of common resources. So, yes, the, 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 the tragedy of the commons does exist, she says, but there are ways that this sort of community-based um, organizations can solve these issues, right? There's a way for a group of herders to solve the issue of overgrazing that doesn't involve right, cutting up the land for me to own my plot and you to own your plot or the government coming in and sort of solving the issue for us. So she identified key principles for effective governance of common poor resources, right? Clearly defined boundaries and membership, right? who's part of the club, who is not. Um, sort of important is the congruence between rules and local conditions. Oftentimes an outsider will come in and sort of say, oh, this is a problem, right? Here are some rules that we can sort of will solve the problem, but those rules are often against sort of local conditions or local norms that we're trying to sort of mediate or mitigate this problem. And so there's this tension, right? Maybe the sort of top-down rules can create more problems than, um, than they fix. Monitoring sanctioning mechanisms uh, or conflict resolution mechanisms, just sort of talking, working it out, trying to come to a, to a, a resolution. So she demonstrated that the potential for self-organization and collective action in managing common, common pool resources is greater than we might think, um, greater than the sort of blackboard sort of puzzle that I sort of outlined earlier might be. All right, so the fourth potential issue, which is related to uh, the tragedy of the commons. And I want to spend much more time on this because I think it really gets at this sort of question of are markets efficient, uh, yes or no, is this idea of an externality. So what is an externality? An externality arises when the production or consumption of a good or service imposes a cost or benefit on a third party outside of the market transaction between the producer and consumer. So sort of diagrammatically, um, sort of I'm, I'm if my firm is sort of producing some unit of output, 
then I'll set my own personal marginal cost to the sort of price that results in an uh, optimal output of the firm, your X star. But say I'm sort of producing something that sort of emits smoke right into the atmosphere. Well, then there's some other social marginal costs that I'm not taking account of. Right? There's personal marginal costs of sort of producing the good, but in producing the good, I'm emitting smoke, and that is imposing a burden on others, right? people who breathe the air, people down, down, uh, down the street. So there's some social marginal cost, which is the the cost of the cost to others of the smoke and my own marginal cost. And this wedge here is what we can think of as the externality, that difference. So to repeat, the externality arises when the production or consumption of a good or service imposes a cost or benefit on the third party outside of that market transaction between producer and consumer. So you see here, when I'm only thinking about my own private cost, that I tend to overproduce goods. When I take into account the social costs of my actions, then this is sort of the, the optimal output of the firm. So to give some examples, you know, kind of think about the different types of externalities. Um, the most popular is sort of negative externality, a cost imposed onto others. Classic example is cigarette smoking. Right, you're on the bus, sort of enjoying your cigarette. You're sort of getting personal benefit from it. Um, you're sort of taking in the personal cost of doing it. But you're also sort of imposing a cost on others. People are sort of smelling the smoke. Um, perhaps it's uh, they don't like the smell. There's sort of secondhand smoke that they're sort of breathing in. And this is a cost imposed onto others. Right? We've all had noisy neighbors. Right? Your neighbor is loud. Right, maybe listening to music, really enjoying himself, but imposing a cost on you. The other one I sort of mentioned is pollution from a factory, right? producing a good, getting benefits from it, taking it, but imposing costs on others. We don't often talk talk about positive externalities, but they do exist. These are benefits to others. Um, example I like to think of is the beautification of one's property. Right, if you spend a lot of time on your property, sort of growing flowers or a garden or sort of mowing the lawn, then there's a marginal cost of doing that, a you know, personal marginal cost. But if I drive by and I go, wow, that, that lawn is super nice. I, there's some, I gain some benefit from that. That's a sort of benefit in, imposed on me or a benefit to me. So this is sort of flip of the negative externality. As you can imagine, these negative externalities, costs imposed on others are the thing most people focus on in terms of uh, market inefficiencies or public policy. But you should remember this, the positive externalities are there too. And in some sense, they're an inefficient inefficiency as well because they're benefits that do that you have, but that I am not taking in. So in a, in a negative externality or example of a negative externality, the person sort of engaging in the activity does too much of it, right? Maybe you would prefer if the person next to you on the bus was not smoking. You prefer if the neighbor wasn't as loud. Um, positive externality is they do too little of it, right? Wouldn't it be great if the guy would spend more time on his wonderful lawn? So here's some ill shave examples. Um, I sort of already went over this, the tragedy of the commons. Um, two sort of famous ones that I kind of want to highlight that will come up later. So I want to talk about them in terms of thinking further about these issues. The first is the noisy confectioner and the doctor. So the doctor sets up his examination room or his consulting room in somewhere in his office. And unbeknownst to him, or maybe he's a new doctor in the area, there's a confectioner. It's someone who bakes or bakes cakes, sort of decorates cakes in the abutting office, right? On the other side of that wall of his examination room. And he and the confectioner has this machine that in the act of producing a cake is very loud. And it's a bit annoying to the doctor. And it's so annoying to the doctor that he can't even engage in his activities. And he can't listen to the patient's heartbeat. It's just too loud. 
So this noisy confectioner is harming the doctor. He, even he's harming his business in that way. So you see the negative externality here. Another classic example um, to sort of help picture what's going on here is railroad sparks and crop fields. Oftentimes railroads are sort of near or abut crops. But as the, the, the train goes down the railroad, that metal on metal grading often produces sparks. And uh, a bit of life advice, never mix sparks and sort of dry grain. So a big ne negative externality of sort of the, the railroad would be potential crop fires along the railroad. Again, the sort of railroad imposing this cost onto farmers, the crop owners. Some consequences of externalities. Like I said earlier, negative externalities lead to overproduction of harmful goods or activities, while positive externalities lead to underproduction of beneficial goods and activities. As a result, there's a sort of inefficient allocation of resources. Um, market prices do not reflect the full social costs or benefits of the activities taking place. So how do we address these issues? Um, I'm gonna spend a sort of good amount of time trying to think about this. Um, the first is government, inter government intervention, taxes or subsidies, which we like to call Puguvian taxes or subsidies. And I'll get into why we call them Puguvian. Another is regulations or standards. A, a second option, a second way to address this problem, is the enforcement of property rights and Kosian bargaining. And again, I'll get into why we call it Kosian. So first, Pugu and Puguvian taxes. This is Arthur Pugu, 1877 to 1959, a famous economist, economist worth reading, worth looking up. First formulated the concept of an externality in his book, The Economics of Welfare, in 1920. So he sort of, he didn't even call it a Bolivian tax, but we've sort of come to call sort of a tax on any market activity that generates negative externalities. So I think I have it on the next slide. Again, I said there's this wedge between marginal cost and, or sorry, personal marginal cost and social marginal cost. If we were going to tax that item, right, the doctor or the, the confectioner is being too loud, he's harming the doctor, we can set a tax that is sort of equivalent to this, this wedge here that pushes personal marginal cost to align with social marginal, co social marginal cost, therefore eliminating the externality. Right? If we tax the noisy confectioner for being so noisy, well, then he'll do less of it. Right. And so his output will fall, which is what we want him to do in this situation. So, again, a tax of negative externalities induces firms to reduce the damage imposed on others, while a positive attack, a subsidy sort of does the flip. It induces an increase in the externality generating activity. This is kind of the core. Um, policy prescription in economics concerning these externalities with tax or subsidize it. Well, that, at least until Ronald Coase. Um, Ronald Coase is, was alive from 1910 to 2013, sort of at the forefront of multiple sort of economic literatures, the primary one being law and economics, sort of bringing in law into economics and economics into law. Uh, he published this sort of famous paper, this sort of very long paper called The Problem of Social Cost in the 1960 issue of the Journal of Law and Economics. He won the Nobel Prize for essentially this paper. And it's a very long paper. It's worth reading and sort of meditating on. I'm going to try to sort of bring out some key, key things about it. Um, but I, I would encourage you to read it on your own. And it, it's a very subtle paper. So definitely stick with it and sort of finish it, go all the way. 
So some key ideas that come out of Bono Coase and the problem of social cost in 1960. The first big one is what we call the Coase theorem, which Coase didn't actually really articulate. Um, George Stigler later sort of put these words into Coase's mouth. But the, this idea of the Coase theorem is, it's in there in the problem of social cost, if you read carefully. So the Coase theorem goes, if property rights are well-defined, and if the parties involved, the confectioner and the doctor, can reach and enforce agreements at zero transactions cost, then the final outcome will be efficient regardless of the initial assignment of property rights. This gets into the idea of Coasean bargaining, right? Now you see the Coasean aspect. Parties can negotiate and make side payments to internalize externalities. So the, think about the confectioner and the doctor. The doctor is so fed up uh, with the noise, he can't do his business. He goes over to the confectioner and says, okay, how much money do I have to pay you to turn the thing off from say noon to three or to turn it off all day or to lower your production of cakes? How much do I have to pay? Right? Does, does that, the parties can negotiate and make these side payments to sort of internalize the externality. And the confectioners might say, well, if you pay me $100, that evens out what I would but I would make on the market if I were to sell the cakes that I was going to produce. So I even out. Okay, so then you would have to pay me $100 to stop producing from 12 to three or something like that. Another example is a sort of factory that pollutes nearby residents, right, downriver. Um, they can compensate them for the pollution. Say, well, we're not gonna sort of stop polluting, but we'll pay you to sort of compensate for these four your sort of loss of, um, or for the costs that we're imposing upon you. Some implications that come out of this, uh, Coasean bargain, Coasean bargaining highlights the importance of well-defined property rights and low transactions costs. All right, if these things hold, then externalities aren't really a problem to sort of be mediated by uh, negotiating parties. It suggests private solutions to externalities may be possible and will likely sort of come about through voluntary means. And it challenges the need for government intervention in some cases, not, I don't wanna say all cases, but in situations where the property rights are well-defined and the transactions costs, right? You can think of the, the cost of sort of negotiating between these part, between parties is low, then there's no need for sort of government intervention in these situations. Now, I, I sort of can, I know what you're thinking because um, everyone says it or everyone thinks it. A common interpretation of the Coase theorem is to assume zero transactions cost and then point out that, well, in the real world, um, Coase, transactions costs are not zero. We, we don't live in that world. So thus, the Coase theorem is either wrong or it's useless. It, it doesn't actually apply in the real world. But Coase only assumes zero transactions costs in his analysis for the first 15 pages of his article. All right, and I have proof. All right, here we're on page 15. Um, midway down the page, he's now going to consider a world where transactions cost transactions, cost of market transactions are taken into account. All right, for the majority of the article. Coase considers a positive transactions cost world. And so with Coase, we're going to sort of explore that. Does, is what Coase is saying hold um, in a positive transactions cost world? So first, why does he make this move? Why does he assume zero transactions cost? Well, in Pagu's discussion of taxation subsidies, he assumes perfect competition, sort of implying transactions cost. Right? Under equilibrium and perfect competition, the full cost of a choice fully incorporated into the price of the good or service being sold. So what's, what's Coase saying? Well, in perfect competition, well, where there are zero transactions costs, this externality that you're pointing out, Pugu, it's not a problem. Right? It will just be internalized by private actors through these negotiations. So therefore, the sort of policy prescription that Pugu is making is unnecessary or redundant. 
So it's a sort of analytical move against Pugo. Pugo, Pugo is saying, well, even in a world of perfect competition, there are externalities. Coase is saying, that's not true. But we can go further. Um, so I, was, I sort of want to highlight the sort of key points that I get out of the social, the problem of social cost. And there's subtle points. So I'll try to make them as clear as possible. The first is the idea of the sort of reciprocal nature of the problem. Coase writes, the question is commonly thought of, of, of as one in which A inflicts harm on B, and what has to be decided is how should we restrain A? But this is wrong. We're dealing with a problem of reciprocal nature. To avoid the harm to B, to avoid the harm to B would inflict harm on A. The real question that has to be decided is, should A be allowed to harm B, or should B be allowed to harm A? The problem is to avoid the, problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Back to our sort of doctor and confectionery um, example. The doctor's work would not have been disturbed if the confectioner had not worked his machinery. Right? We already said that. But the machinery would have would have been would have disturbed the doctor had he not set up his consulting room in that particular room. In some sense, the doctor is at fault as well. Right? He was the one who chose to put his examination room in the one abutting the confectioner, the noisy confectionery. Right? He could move it. He could have, he could have put it somewhere else. Right? By putting his examination room there, he's sort of partly at fault. Uh, a second key point is that we should always remember to look at the total effect. Uh, here's Coase, uh, page 27. It would seem desirable to summarize the burden of this long section. It's a long paper. The problem which we face in dealing with actions which have harmful effects is not simply one of restraining those responsible for them. What has to be decided is whether the gain from preventing the harm is greater than the loss which would be suffered elsewhere as a result of stopping the action which produces the harm. This sort of gets into the idea, well, that the optimal amount of, say, pollution is rarely zero. Um, we have to think about the total effect. It is enough for my purpose to show, again, quoting Coase, that from an economic point of view, a situation in which there is, quote, uncompensated damage done to surrounding woods by sparks from railway engines is not necessarily undesirable. Whether it is desirable or not depends on the particular circumstances. So we could we sort of have this sparks and um, prop problem. The Puguvian tax could in theory sort of just tax the sort of railway out of existence, solving the externality. But is that really what we wanna do? Do we wanna live in a world where there are no railways? No, not necessarily, right? Maybe we're willing to sort of put up with some amount of crop fires in order to have the benefits of the railway. So we need to think about the sort of total effect. As a result, the goo and others missed the point entirely. Here's, here's Coase again. The question at issue is not whether it is desirable to run an additional train or a faster train or install smoke preventing for a smoke preventing device. The question at issue is whether it is desirable to have a system in which the, ra the railway has to compensate those who suffer damage from the fires, which it causes, or one in which the railway does not have to compensate them. Here's the key sentence. When an economist is comparing alternative social arrangements, the proper procedure is to compare the total social product yielded by those these different arrangements. These sort of marginal questions are miss the point. So we need to think very hard about, well, what world would we like to live in? Would we like to live in a world where there are no trains, but there's a there are crops that never get burned? Perhaps not, but maybe, maybe, um, but perhaps not. And so we need to think about these sort of bigger issues. And this sort of comes full circle to questions of efficiency. What do we mean by, to say that things are efficient? Well, as Frank Knight has so often emphasized, 
problems of welfare economics must ultimately dissolve into the study of aesthetics and morals. Do we want to live in a world where maybe there's some pollution, but there's some larger benefit? Um, yes or no, or how much pollution balanced by how much benefit? Um, they're hard questions and they're difficult to, they can't be solved on a blackboard, right? They sort of often dissolve in the study of aesthetics and morals. Uh, I would be remiss to sort of uh, give a whole lecture on potential market failures and not discuss government failures. Um, this is just one slide. Uh, I could do a whole presentation on just this one slide, but it's often assumed that the state can solve market failures. Uh, in fact, I've sort of done some of that today, but the state is not an all knowing, is not all knowing or all powerful. It, it, it often does not even know what the answer is to set market failures. I kind of highlighted a little bit of that with Coase, but even if we're thinking like of the Pugovian tax, well, how much, like how big of a tax? Now we have to go out and measure it and that's difficult, right? Also, it's by no means obvious that the state is some benevolent public welfare maximizing entity. Um, think of the public choice literature with Jim Buchanan and Gordon Tullock. The state or bureaucrats are, af are, are often sort of out for themselves. Uh, they have their own profits to maximize. So it's not obvious that there's some benevolent public welfare maximizing entity that can, with laser-like precision, sort of solve these um, market failures. Right. In fact, they often lead to government failures or bigger problems by intervening. In thinking about addressing market failures, don't sort of fall victim to the second singer fallacy. Uh, the idea is a king or ruler wants to have a contest for to sort of figure out, well, who's the best sing the best singer in all the land? So he asks his lackeys to sort of go out and pick two contenders. They come back and they say, well, uh, King, these are the two best singers in your realm, right? They're going to sing, and then you will decide who is the best singer in the realm. And the king listens to the first singer, and it's just horrible. It's just, it's off tune or it's off key. It's out of tune. It can't hold a beat. Uh, and the king says, well, the second singer must be the best in the realm because nobody could possibly be worse than that guy. Well, don't fall victim to the second singer fallacy. Always listen to the second singer before you make your judgment. The second singer here being the government, right? When you see a market failure, don't leap to the idea that the, the state can sort of solve this problem because you don't know how good the second singer is. No matter how bad the market failure is or how bad the first singer is, the second singer could always be worse. All right? And remember to consider the total effect. Don't just sort of think of these sort of issues on the margin. Do think hard about large questions of well, if we sort of impose this tax, what does that mean for the railroad, for the railroad industry, for the economy as a whole? So on that, I'm sort of wrapping up uh, this lecture on our markets efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. So, so far we only have one question. It's um, how, common are market failures in the real world? I would say pretty common. Um, the question is how big of a deal any individual market failure is, I think, and how quickly they're resolved by, you know, entrepreneurs trying to seek a profit opportunity. Um, again, if you sort of pull up a, if you sort of read the newspaper, you'll sort of see these externality problems come up a lot. Often, if you read the the sort of story, you often find, oh, like the the people sort of adjudicated the issue on their own. But to the extent of an, other market failures for you know, monopoly, yeah, potentially quite rampant. Um, 
I think. And a related question to that is, do you think that market failures scale up with the development of our markets or do you think that they decrease? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my line is markets fail, thus we should have more markets, right? Markets often fail because there's a sort of lack of markets, uh, right? There's like this sort of missing market and having more markets, more robust markets, I think minimizes the amount of um, market failures. Even in the sense what there's a market failure, right? In the sort of blackboard sense, that encourages entrepreneurs, right, business people to try to solve that issue, right? So there's a lot of people working on, well, how do we operate our manufacturing business while not polluting as much? That's in some sense of sort of trying to solve the market failure without, that's a market-based solution to solving the market failure, if that makes sense. Okay, great. I don't think we have any more questions from the audience. So thank you very much, Jacob. And remember, we will have John Cochrane from the Hoover Institution and, and Stanford University on Thursday. So hope to see you. Yeah, yeah he's great. Do attend. He's great.